Rouge, which is Canada's first national urban park. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Vanessa and my pronouns are she and they. And I'm a part of the Learn to Camp team at Parks Canada at Rouge National Urban Park in Toronto. And I'm here with my coworker, Briley, who will also introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Briley and my pronouns are she and her. I'm also a part of the Learn to Camp team. I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, I'm here to help answer any questions you might have. So throughout the presentation, if you do have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat and I can respond to them. Thanks, Riley. So Parks Canada would first like to acknowledge that Rouge National Urban Park is built on the ancestral land of many nations, including the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat, and Mississaugas of the Credit. And at Rouge National Urban Park, we are very proud to be working with 10 First Nations through the First Nations Advisory Circle on the establishment, planning, and management of the park. And we work closely with the First Nations partners on a number of important projects, including archaeological fieldwork, restoration projects, and the development of visitor facilities. So since we're all on a video call today and not actually in Rouge National Urban Park, we'd like to encourage all of you to learn the history of the land in your area by exploring the nativeland.ca website. So Riley will put the link to that in the chat for you. June is also National Indigenous History Month. And this year, National Indigenous History Month is dedicated to the missing children, families left behind, and the survivors of residential schools. So to learn more about National Indigenous History Month, you can visit the project website and follow the related hashtags on social media. So today we'll begin by introducing Parks Canada, and then we'll dive a bit deeper into information about Rouge National Urban Park. And we'll touch on topics such as parks history, its work, how you can stay connected, along with some other topics. So here is a beautiful photo of Fundy National Park in New Brunswick. And as you can see, the Red Parks Canada chairs are highlighted, and they can be found at national parks all across the country. You get a chance to visit, see if you can find them, take a photo while you're there. So a bit about Parks Canada. So it was the world's first um, national park service and it was founded over 110 years ago on May 19, 1911. And today we protect over 450,000 square kilometers of land in Canada. So that's about eight times the size of Nova Scotia in, to in total. So this slide shows our mandate at Parks Canada. So on behalf of the people of Canada, we protect and present nationally significant examples of Canada's natural and cultural heritage, foster public understanding, appreciation, and enjoyment in ways that ensure their ecological and commemorative integrity for present and future generations. That is from the Parks Canada Agency's charter from 2002. So this map shows the locations of all of our protected areas across the country. So you can see our national parks, national historic sites, and national marine conservation areas. And we'll talk a bit about each of these in a little more detail. So the first way that we deliver Parks Canada's mandate is through national parks. So Canada's national parks are some of the most iconic and treasured places in the country, providing critical habitat to countless species of plants and animals, giving Canadians opportunities to connect with nature. Parks Canada conserves and protects 48 national parks across the country. The oldest of them is Banff National Park, 
which was established all the way in 1885. And Banff is actually among the oldest national parks in the world, along with Yellowstone National Park in the United States and Royal National Park in Australia. And Parks Canada also co-manages many national parks and marine conservation areas alongside indigenous peoples. And some examples of these are Guayana's National Park Reserve and National Marine Conservation Area, and Haida Heritage Site in BC, and Sir Malik National Park in Nunavut. So this is a map of all the nationally protected areas in Ontario. The green dots on the map indicate national parks. The yellow areas indicate, or the yellow dots indicate um, national historic sites. And the blue areas are national marine conservation areas. So if you can see the purple dot, number 21, besides Toronto, that's actually the Rouge. So as you can see in Ontario, we have five green areas, so five different national parks. And although they are a little far away from Toronto, they're all really cool and definitely worth checking out. But in particular, um, the proximity of Rouge National Urban Park to the greater Toronto area is a big part of what makes it so special and what makes it a national urban park. And the second way that we deliver Parks Canada's mandate is through National Historic Sites. So Parks Canada preserves and manages 171 of Canada's more than 970 National Historic Sites across the country. This includes national treasures such as Far U Ranch in Alberta, Discard Lighthouse in British Columbia, and Benoit Papineau in Quebec. For the closest national historic sites to the Rouge that are managed by Parks Canada are the HMCS Haida in Hamilton and a cluster of five sites in Niagara-on-the-Lake. So that includes Fort George, Fort Mississauga and Mississauga Point, Butler's Barracks, and the battlefield of Fort George. Many of Canada's newest national historic sites that are managed by Parks Canada also reflect the, health, the history and culture of Indigenous peoples and the diverse cultural communities who make up Canada. And yet another way that Parks Canada delivers its mandate is through national marine conservation areas. So in the 1980s, Parks Canada entered the domain of marine ecosystems and today manages four national marine conservation areas across the country. So number one is Guayanas in BC. Number two is Saguenay in Quebec. Number three is Lake Superior in Ontario. Number four is Fathom Five, which is also in Ontario and was the first of them in Canada. So national marine conservation areas are a pretty important area because Canada has just such a rich marine heritage and also has the longest coastline in the whole world. So that's over 243,000 kilometers along three oceans plus 950,000 kilometers or 950 kilometers along the Great Lakes. Another thing about national marine conservation areas is that they have a distinct combination of physical and biological characteristics that make them unique. So this includes submerged lands and the water above them, such as wetlands, estuaries, islands, and other coastal lands, as well as any species that are found in these areas. And when you visit these national marine conservation areas, you get to learn and see the protection of seabeds and the water, marine and coastal habitats, diversity of terrestrial and aquatic species, and many archaeological, geological, and historical features that are unique to each conservation area. So this beautiful picture was taken half an hour away from Toronto's city centre at one of the last remaining working farms in the GTA that is located inside Rouge National Urban Park, which brings me to our next segment, 
So I'll talk a bit about Rouge National Urban Park from now on. So um, there was a lot of history at Rouge National Urban Park before Parks Canada came into the picture. And in 1954, Hurricane Hazel caused flooding and property damage, which led to the formation of conservation authorities across the province of Ontario to manage and protect land and communities from future flood damage. The Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, or the TRCA, was then created to protect and manage watersheds in the Greater Toronto Area, which includes the Rouge Watershed. The original Rouge Park was established by the province of Ontario in 1955, or 1995, sorry. And in, during that time, it was only 50,000 or 50 square kilometers parkland. And it was managed by the TRCA. And then later on, the Rouge Park Alliance, formed by advocacy from the Scarborough community and some other communities, and through the work of notable individuals in response to a growing demand for recreational trails throughout these protected areas. There was also a lot of community-driven conservation and stewardship that uh, led to the formation of the park. So the decision for Rouge Park to become a national park was made in 2011 after a study determined that creating a national park would be the best way to protect and manage the growing number of protected areas inside and nearby the park. So the government of Canada and the neighboring municipalities, Markham, York, Durham, and Pickering, each contributed lands to what later became Rouge National Urban Park. So while Toronto and the surrounding cities began to develop and expand, we saw many groups and important figures fight for the protection of Rouge Park, which later became, and without their hard work and their dedication in the past, Canada's first national urban park might not even have existed. So later, after Rouge Park came to existence, we continued having more volunteers who took their time to help protect the park and assisted with work that was being done at Rouge Park through the Rouge Park Alliance. So this slide shows a bit of the history of the park through the Parks Canada lens. So as I mentioned, the park was first established in Parks Canada in 2011. And the park has changed a lot over the years since then. So Parks Canada first committed to the creation of the park in 2011. And since then, the agency has consulted with more than 20,000 Canadians, has been working closely with First Nations, the levels of government, community groups, conservationists, farmers, and residents to realize the dream of creating Canada's first national urban park. So in 2012, the First Nations Advisory Circle was established. In 2013 to 2015, there were some land transfers that went through. 2014, the draft management plan was released for public review. And what that is, is a document that guides the management of the park over a 10 year period. Then finally, in May 2015, the park was officially created. And then there were some more land transfers and now today, 97% of these land transfers are complete and the park is approximately 70, um, nine, yeah, 79 square kilometers of land. So um, Parks Canada is also working hard to uh, complete these land transfers and they also encourage visitors to help with this special place whenever possible while we try, while we continue to improve and establish visitor services and amenities such as restrooms, um, signage, trails, and day use areas. So this slide also shows a bit of a timeline for the park's creation all the way from 2011 to 2012 when the um, various entities and various um, administrative things were being put into place to, through to the land transfers that took place over time and uh, all the way to the present day. So 
So as of today, um, Parks Canada manages about 75.1 square kilometers of the 79.1 square kilometers of the lands intended for Rouge National Urban Park. And once the land transfers are completed, Rouge National Urban Park will be the largest urban park in all of North America. So the photo on the right is a photo of the park. And as you can see, it goes all the way down from Lake Ontario in the south, all the way up to um, area um, within Markham and Whitchurch Stowville. <coughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So it goes all the way up to the northern areas in Markham and Whitchurch Stowville into an area called Oak Ridges Moraines, where there are a lot of different hills and farmland areas. Now, as you can see in the photo on the right, the park crosses many communities, such as the township of Uxbridge, city of Pickering, Toronto, Markham, as well as the town of Witcher Stouffville. And these areas are also highlighted in different colors on the map. So one big question is, why create a national urban park in Toronto? And one response to that is that more than 7 million Canadians, so around 20% of Canada's population, lives in the greater Toronto area. And all the other national parks that are close or that are the nearest are around a three hour drive away. But with the creation of Rouge National Urban Park, the largest city in the country now has a national urban park that is within a one hour drive, is accessible for all, and is always free to visit. We are actually the only national, nationally protected area that is accessible by public transit. So that means that you can take the GO train, the subway, the TTC, or a shuttle bus to get here, among other options. So the main access points to the park with parking spots are along Zoo Road, Razor Road, and 19th Avenue. But if you'd like more information, you can always find out um, more on about how to get here on our website. So here's a list of some activities that you can do in the park. So you can go hiking, and there's currently around 15 different trails throughout the park. Most of these trails are um, ranked as easy or moderate. And there's different views that are all amazing of different marshes, marshes, rivers, bluffs, and meadows. You can also go cycling. So the park's farmland and forests provide a lovely rural atmosphere and sense that you're far away from the city, even though you're actually not that far away. There are also a few traffic lights while you're biking but there are lots of different hills and it, they provide a really nice workout. But also please note that cycling is not per permitted on hiking trails in order to protect sensitive national e natural ecosystems and to reduce trail erosion. Instead, if you'd like to learn more about cycling paths, you can check the website or the park's road network. Typically, um, you can camp at Rouge National Urban Park, but unfortunately, our campground is currently under renovations. But you can always check back next summer for opportunities to camp at our campground, which is called Glen Rouge Campground. You can also go fishing in the park. So the mouth of Rouge River and the surrounding marsh area are very popular fishing spots. And fishing in the park is permitted as long as you have your valid Ontario fishing license. And you can also go swimming at the park. So swimming at Rouge Beach is a very popular activity, especially during summer. And you can also go bird watching. So it's a pretty fun activity that you can do all year round. All you really need is a pair of binoculars or a bird guide to help you with identifying them. So what makes a national urban park unique? So the concept of a national urban park was something that was pretty new for Parks Canada. And the concept of Rouge National Urban Park is pretty monumental because it is Canada's first and only national urban park. So the Rouge has many roads and two 400 series highways that cross through, as well as many railways that serve freight trains and commuter trains. It also has 
some of the last um, natural, but it ha also has some of the last um, working farms in the greater Toronto area. So the Rouge is a large natural space that is surrounded by urban development. And it's special because it also has some of the last working farms in the GTA, as I mentioned. So the park conserves and protects the natural, cultural, and agricultural heritage of the area. So the Rouge is actually home to Toronto's largest remaining wetland and some rare Carolinian forests. It also has over 1,700 species of plants and animals. So that's 762 plant species, 225 bird species, it's five fish species, 27 animal species, and 19 reptile and amphibian species. And here on the right, we have some pictures of some of the most popular and special species of the Rouge that we protect, that we rely on visitors to help us. So the first um, image is of the Trillium, which is also Ontario's provincial flower. And the second item is the Baltimore O'Reilly, which is a type of bird. And number three is the monarch butterfly. And number four is the landings turtle, which is pretty special to us at the Rouge. So the park also preserves its cultural heritage. And at the Rouge, there is over 10,000 years of human history, as well as some of Canada's oldest indigenous sites. So many First Nations have lived, hunted, and fished on the land and um, cultivated crops such as squash, corn, and beans. The river was also used as a means of transportation and later as a trade route, used or known as, as the Carrying Place Trail, which also includes the Humber River. Then as European culture settled on the land, more farming was established, orchard and livestock were brought in, and roads were established as the different neighborhoods in Toronto grew. And since then, communities nearby the Rouge, as well as the Rouge Parks Alliance, have been protecting them from urban development, and Parks Canada has then stepped in to help protect, conserve, and manage the area. As well, the formation of the Rouge Na or the First Nations Advisory Circle ensures that we are able to protect the cultural heritage of the park from the past present and into the future. So um, our First Nations Advisory Circle plays an important role to the park because they're consulted on with all the activities in and the decisions of the park. As well, the agricultural heritage of the park has been preserved. So in the late 1800s, farmers from Pennsylvania moved to Canada and started to develop their farming routes in Ontario and some of them continue to farm in Rouge Valley today. Many farms in the Rouge are also located on class one soil, which is the rarest and most fertile soil in all of Canada. The Rouge National Urban Park is also different from other, all other Parks Canada sites and locations because Parks Canada has made it a point to preserve the, the cultural heritage of the park and also relies on visitors to help protect the agricultural lands in the Rouge. So now I'll talk about a few examples of some past and ongoing projects at Rouge National Urban Park that we are proud of. So the first one is the Blanding's Turtle Recovery Project. So currently, Blanding's turtles are considered a threatened species in Canada and Ontario. So they can live for up to 80 years, and they're always smiling. So they're nicknamed the smiling turtle because of the yellow underneath their chin that makes it look like they're smiling. Turtles also play a role in many Indigenous people's spiritual beliefs and ceremonies. And to many Algonquin and Iroquois speaking peoples, Tur turtles are a teacher and they play an integral role in the creation story by allowing the earth to be formed on its back. The 13 spots on the shell indicate 13 full moons of the year. And there are also some legends on how the Blanding's turtle got its yellow chin 
And in many indigenous stories, the turtle is referred to as the turtle with the sun under its chin. If you're interested in learning more about these stories or traditional ecological knowledge, our partners at the Toronto Zoo and their collaborators put together ways of knowing wide, and we'll send the link to that in the chat. So this shows a bit of a timeline of the Landings Turtle Recovery Project. So in 2014, there were only around seven turtles in the wild in the park. So that was when the project really started and we worked with partners to release 10 turtles into the park. And then in 2015, we released 21 more and more and more as time went on with every passing year. And as of today, we have released 272 year old Landings turtles and 184 hatchling Landings turtles into a variety of wetland habitats Bruce National Urban Park. We are also on track to release another um, 49 turtles into wetland habitats, which will bring the total number, number of Head Start turtles released to 319. So Parks Canada works with many partners like the Toronto Zoo and adopt a pond to raise the populations of landing turtles to a stable level. The Toronto Zoo is leading the Head Start project where the eggs of landing turtles from healthy populations in Canada are brought to the Toronto Zoo to grow for the next two years. So these landing turtles don't hibernate and they just keep growing over winter. So that allows the size that they reach after two years to be equivalent to a four-year-old landing turtle in the wild. Overall, the growth of the Head Start project has been pretty incredible. If you consider that all the way in 2014, there were only around seven turtles in the park in the wild, and now there's over hundreds of them. So there have also been many restoration and farmland enhancement projects in the park. So to date, there have been 77 ecological restoration projects in the Rouge, which saw more than 71 hectares of wetlands and forest habitats restored. And in collaboration with our partners, more than 56,000 native trees and shrubs will be planted this year in the park. And this tree planting project is a collaboration between Parks Canada, TRCA, Forest Ontario, and it's made possible by the Government of Canada's Two Billion Trees Commitment. As well, archaeology has a big focus at the Rouge. With ten, over 10,000 years of human history, there's an abundance of cultural and historical heritage. And in the past years, Rouge National Urban Park has conducted archaeological fieldwork on many sites throughout the park. An archaeological assessment is a part of the impact assessment process that is required by law in Canada before any development work can take place. This ensures that important cultural sites are understood and protected where needed. First Nations Advisory Circle Field Liaisons also join the Rouge Archaeology team on site to conduct field work. Overall in the park, there are approximately 326 registered archaeological sites both indigenous and settler. And these date all the way from the archaic period through to the contact period and well into the 20th century. And the Rouge National Urban Park also works with 10 First Nations who sit on the First Nations Advisory Circle or Committee, which includes the Seven Williams Treaties Nations, the Sasagas of the Credit First Nation, Six Nations of the Grand River, and the Huron Wendat First Nation. So the park also works with First Nations Advisory Circle on many different projects throughout the Rouge. So I'll talk about a few of these. So one of these is through annual um, FNAC meetings. So these are annual or biannual meetings dependent on what the field unit requires to have roundtable sharing and discussions about ongoings at the park related to visitor experience, resource conservation, capital and asset projects, and other topics. And these meetings are also an important way for the Rouge National Urban Park 
to fulfill our duty to consult and build relationships with the First Nations partners. So another way is through employee awareness. So the Indigenous Relations team regularly engages with the Rouge National Urban Park staff to build awareness and education on Indigenous issues and topics. The Indigenous Relations team has also hosted movies and short film screenings, the guest speakers, with Indigenous artists from the First Nations Advisory Circle, and hosted topics such as Indigenous Toronto. The Indigenous Relations team also conducts weekly media scans to raise awareness about the latest news in Indigenous relations. And the third way is through um, project engagement. So one of these is through the Bruges Gateway engagement. So the park's flagship welcome area has been in full engagement mode from early 2021 with project consultants the Rouge staff with over 50 hours of engagement with First Nations Advisory Circle members. And another of these projects is through Stories of Canada, which is a funding opportunity through National Office that allows Rouge National Urban Parks to work with dedicated First Nations Advisory Circle community representatives to work on park projects, including the Rouge Gateway, to collaborate and to share the stories of their respective Indigenous cultures in a meaningful and empowering way. So another, some ways to stay connected with the park. So the best way um, is to always check our website is for the most up-to-date information. There's information on what you can do at the park, how to get there, what events are currently ongoing. So typically we have some in-person events, but these activities are currently not available due to COVID. But we do hope that we'll be able to resume them soon in the future. Some of these include guided walks, community festivals, stewardship events, and learn to camp overnight trips in the park. So some tips on how to help the Rouge during COVID. So please, again, always check our website before you go so that you're up to date with what's going on in the park. You can also visit during our downtimes, so early mornings, late evenings during the week. Also carry a mask with you and physically distance from other visitors. You can also visit other areas of the park that are less crowded. Many of our visitors tend to stay in the south end near the beach we have lots of great trails and areas to explore in the northern end of the park as well. Most importantly, please do not litter, dump garbage, or harvest in the park. We want to keep it as clean as possible, so please take everything that you bring with you. So for more information, feel free to visit our website, check out our social medias on Twitter and Facebook, or also um, send us an email or give us a phone call if you have any questions or concerns. So that brings us to the end of this presentation. 